guest, Mr. Aldous Huxley, renowned essayist and novelist who, during the spring semester, is residing at the university in his capacity as a Ford Research Professor. Mr. Huxley has recently returned from a conference at the Institute for the Study of Democratic Institutions in Santa Barbara, where the discussion focused on the development of new techniques by which to control and direct human behavior. Traditionally, it has been possible to suppress individual freedom but through the application of physical coercion, through the appeal of ideologies, uh, through the manipulation of man's physical and social environment, and more recently through the uh, techniques, the cruder techniques of psychological conditioning. The ultimate revolution about which Mr. Huxley will speak today concerns itself with the development of new behavioral controls which operate directly upon the psychophysiological organisms of man, that is, the capacity to replace external constraint by internal compulsions. As those of us who are familiar with Mr. Huxley's uh, works well know, this is a subject with which he has been concerned for, for quite a period of time. Uh, Mr. Huxley will make a presentation of approximately half an hour, followed by some brief discussions and questions by the two panelists sitting to my left, uh, Ms. Lillian Rivlin and Mr. John Post. And Mr. Huxley. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, first of all, the, uh, I'd like to say that the conference at Santa Barbara was not directly concerned with the control of the mind. That was uh, a conference, uh, there have been two of them now, at the University of California Medical Center in San Francisco, one this year, which I didn't attend, and one two years ago, where, where there was a considerable discussion on this uh, subject. At Santa Barbara, we were talking about technology in general and the, um, the effects it's likely to have on society and the problems uh, related to uh, technological uh, transplanting of technology, uh, technology into underdeveloped countries. Well, now, in regard to this problem of... Uh, of the ultimate revolution. Uh, this has been very well summed up by the moderator. Uh, in the past, we can say that uh, all revolutions have essentially aimed at changing uh, the environment in order to change the individual. I mean, there's been the uh, political revolution, the economic revolution. Uh, in the time of the Reformation, the religious revolution, uh, all these uh, aimed, as I say, not directly at the human being, but at his surroundings, so that by modifying the surroundings, you did achieve, uh, in, at one remove, a, an effect upon the human being. Today, uh, we are faced, I think, with the approach of what may be called the ultimate revolution, the final revolution, where a man can act directly on uh, the mind body of his fellows. Well, needless to say, some kind of direct action on human mind bodies has been going on since the beginning of time. Uh, but this has generally been uh, of a violent nature. The techniques of terrorism have been known from time immemorial, and uh, w people have employed them with more or less uh, ingenuity, sometimes with the, the utmost crudity, sometimes with a, a good deal of skill inquire, uh, acquired uh, by a process of trial and error, finding out what the best ways of uh, using torture, imprisonment, uh, constraints of various kinds. Uh, but uh, as um, I think it was Metternich said uh, many years ago, uh, you can do everything with bayonets except sit on them. Uh, that if you are going to control any population for any length of time, you must have some measure of consent. It's exceedingly difficult to see uh, how pure terrorism can function indefinitely. It can function for a fairly long time, but I think uh, sooner or later you have to bring in an element of persuasion, an element of, of getting people to consent to what is happening to them. Well, it seems to me that the the nature of the ultimate revolution with which we are now faced is precisely this, uh, that we are in process of developing a whole series of techniques which uh, will enable 
the controlling oligarchy, who have always existed and presumably always will exist, uh, to get people actually to love their servitude. Uh, th this is the, seems to me the, the ultimate uh, in malevolent revolution, shall we say. And uh, this, is a, this is a problem which uh, has interested me for many years and about which I wrote uh, 30 years ago a, a fable, The Brave New World, which uh, is uh, essentially the account of a society making use of all the devices at that time available and some of the devices which uh, uh, I imagined to be possible, uh, making use of them in order to, first of all, to standardize the population, to iron out uh, inconvenient human dis uh, um, differences, uh, to create, uh, so to say, mass-produced uh, models of human beings arranged uh, in some kind of a scientific uh, caste system. And uh, since then I have uh, con continued to be extremely interested uh, in this problem and I have noticed uh, with increasing dismay that uh, a number of the predictions which were purely fantastic when I made them 30 years ago uh, have come true or, or seem in process of coming true. That uh, a number of techniques about which I talked seem to be here already and that there seems to be a general movement uh, in the direction of this kind of ultimate revolution, this, this method of control uh, by which uh, people can be made to enjoy a state of affairs which by any decent standard they ought not to enjoy. Uh, this, I mean, the enjoyment of, uh, of servitude. Well, uh, th this, um, this process, as I say, has uh, gone on for over, over the years, and um, I become more and more interested uh, in what is happening. And here I would like uh, briefly to, uh, to compare what the parable of Brave New World with uh, another parable which was put forth more recently uh, in uh, George Orwell's book, 1984. Uh, Orwell wrote his book between, I think, between 45 and 48 uh, at the time when the Stalini Stalinist uh, terror regime was still in full swing and just after the uh, collapse of the Hitlerian terror regime. And his book, uh, which I admire greatly, it's a book of great, very great talent and extraordinary ingenuity, uh, shows, uh, is so to say, a projection into the future of the immediate past, of what for him was the immediate past, and the immediate present. It was a projection into the future of a society uh, where control was exercised wholly by terrorism, and uh, the violent uh, attacks upon the mind body of individuals. Whereas uh, my own uh, book, which was uh, written in, in 1932, when there was only a, a mild dictatorship in the form of Mussolini uh, in existence, was not overshadowed by the idea of terrorism. And uh, I was therefore free in a way which Orwell was not free, uh, to think about these other methods uh, of control, the, these um, non-violent methods. And my, I'm inclined to think that uh, the scientific dictatorships of the future, and I think there are going to be scientific dictatorships in many parts of the world, will be probably a good deal nearer to the brave new world pattern uh, than to the uh, 1984 pattern. They will be a good deal nearer, not because of any humanitarian qualms in the scientific dictators, but simply because the Brave New World pattern is probably a good deal more efficient than the other. That if you can uh, get people to consent to the state of affairs in which they are living, the state of servitude, the state of being, having their differences ironed out and being made uh, 
uh, amenable to mass production methods on the social level. If you can do this, then you have uh, you are likely to have a much more stable and much more lasting society, uh, a much more easily controllable society than you would if you were relying wholly on clubs and firing squads and concentration camps. Uh, so that uh, my own feeling is that the 1984 picture uh, was tinged, of course, by the uh, immediate uh, past and the present in which uh, Orwell was living, but that the, uh, that the past and present of those years does not represent, I feel, uh, the likely trend of what is going to happen. Needless to say, we shall never get rid of terrorism. This will always uh, find its way to the surface. But I think that uh, insofar as uh, dictators become more and more scientific, more and more concerned with a technically perfect, uh, perfectly running society, uh, they will be more and more interested in the kind of techniques which uh, uh, I imagined and described from existing realities uh, in Brave New World. So that uh, uh, it seems to me then that the, this ultimate revolution is really not very far away, that we already the, a number of the techniques for uh, bringing about this kind of control are here, and it remains to be seen uh, when and where and by whom uh, they will first be applied uh, in any large scale. And first, uh, let me talk about uh, a little bit about the improvement even in the techniques of, of terrorism. Uh, I think there, there have been improvements. So that the uh, the um, uh, Pavlov, after all, made some extremely profound observations, both on animals and on human beings. And he found, uh, among other things, that... Uh, uh, that uh, conditioning uh, techniques applied to animals or humans in a state either of psychological or physical stress uh, sank in, so to say, very deeply into the mind-body of the creature and were extremely difficult to get rid of, that they seem to be embedded more deeply than, than other forms of conditioning. And um, this, of course, uh, this fact, I think, was discovered empirically in the past, people did make use of, uh, of many of these uh, techniques. But uh, the difference between the, the old empirical intuitive methods and our own methods is, is the difference between uh, a sort of hit and miss uh, uh, craftsman's point of view and the genuinely scientific point of view. I mean, I think there is a real uh, difference between ourselves and, say, the inquisitors of the 16th century, we know much more precisely what we are doing uh, than they knew, and we can extend, because of our theoretical knowledge, we can extend uh, what we are doing over a wider area with a greater assurance of, of, uh, of being, uh, uh, producing something which really works. In this context, I would uh, like to mention the extremely interesting chapters in uh, uh, Dr. William Sargent's uh, um, Battle for the Mind, where he uh, points out how intuitively uh, some of the great uh, religious uh, uh, teachers, leaders of the past, uh, hit on the Pavlovian method. He, he speaks specifically of uh, Wesley's method of producing conversions, uh, which were essentially based upon a, a technique of of heightening psychological stress to the limit by talking about hellfire and so making people extremely vulnerable to suggestion and then suddenly releasing this stress by offering the hopes of heaven. And uh, this is a very interesting chapter of showing how, uh, how completely on, a, on purely intuitive and empirical grounds a, a skilled natural psychologist, as Wesley was, uh, could discover these uh, Pavlovian uh, methods. Well, as I say, we now know the reason why these techniques worked, and uh, uh, there is no doubt at all that we can, if we want to, uh, carry them much further uh, than was possible in the past. Uh, 
And of course, in the history of recent history of, of brainwashing, both as applied to uh, prisoners of war and to the uh, lower personnel within the Communist Party in China, uh, we see that the Pavlovian methods have been applied systematically and with, with uh, evidently with extraordinary efficacy. I mean, I think there can be no doubt that uh, by the application of these methods, a very large army of totally devoted people uh, has been created. Uh, the, the conditioning has been driven in, so to say, uh, by kind of psychological iontophoresis, uh, into the very depth of the uh, people's being and has got so deep that it's very difficult for it ever to be rooted out. And uh, these uh, methods, I, I think, are a real refinement on the older methods of terror because they combine methods of terror with methods uh, of uh, acceptance, method that the, the person who he is subjected to a form of, of terroristic stress, uh, but uh, for the purpose of inducing a kind of voluntary, quotes, um, acceptance of uh, the state, into, uh, the psychological state into which he has been driven, and the state of affairs within which he finds himself. So that, as I say, there has been, I think, a, a definite improvement, shall we say, uh, in the, even in the techniques of, of terrorism. Well, then we come to uh, the consideration of other techniques, of, of non-terroristic techniques for uh, inducing consent and for uh, inducing people to love their servitude. Uh, here, I mean, I think we can... Uh, I don't think I can possibly go into all of them because I don't know all of them, but, I mean, I can mention a few of the more obvious uh, uh, methods... Uh, which uh, uh, can now be used and which uh, are based upon recent scientific findings. Uh, first of all, there are the uh, methods connected with uh, straight suggestion and, uh, and hypnosis. I think we know much more about this subject than was, was known in the past. People, of course, have always known about suggestion and Although they didn't know the word hypnosis, uh, they certainly practiced it in uh, various ways. But we uh, have, I think, a much greater knowledge of the, the subject than in the past, and we, we can make use of our knowledge in ways which uh, I think the past was probably never able to make use of, make use of it. Uh, for example, one of the things we have, we now know for certain, is that there is... Uh, of course, an enormous, I mean, this has been always known, a very great uh, difference between individuals in regard to their suggestibility. But we now, I think, uh, know pretty clearly the, the sort of statistical structure of a population in regard to its, uh, to its uh, suggestibility. Uh, it's very interesting uh, when you look at the, the findings in different fields, I mean, in the field of hypnosis, in the field of uh, administering placebos, for example, uh, in the field of general uh, suggestion uh, in states of drowsiness or of light sleep, you will find the same sorts of orders of magnitude continually cropping up. Uh, you will find, for example, that the um, experienced uh, hypnotists uh, will tell one uh, that the number of people, the percentage of people who can be hypnotized with the utmost facility, just like that, uh, is about 20 percent. That about uh, a corresponding number at the other end of the scale are, are very, very difficult or almost impossible to hypnotize. And that in between there lies a, uh, the, a large mass of people who can, with more or less uh, difficulty, uh, be hypnotized. That, that, uh, they can gradually be, if you work hard enough at it, be, be got into the hypnotic state. And in, in the same way, one, uh, the same sort of figures crop up again, for example, in relation to the administration of placebos. A, a big experiment was carried out three or four years ago in the um, General Hospital in Boston on post-operative cases where uh, 
several hundred men and women uh, suffering comparable kinds of pain after serious operations uh, were allowed to, were given uh, injections whenever they asked for them, whenever the pain got bad, and the injections uh, 50% of the time were of morphia and 50% of the time were of distilled water. And about 20% of, the, of those uh, who uh, w went through the experiment, about 20% of them got just as much relief from the distilled water as from the mo morphia. About 20% got no relief from the distilled water. And in between were those who got some relief or got relief uh, occasionally. So here again we see uh, an... an uh, the same sort of, uh, of distribution. And similarly, with regard to uh, what in Brave New World I call hypnopedia, which is the sleep teaching, uh, I was talking not long ago to a man who manufactures uh, records uh, which people can listen to in the, in, during the light part of sleep. I mean, these are records for, for getting rich, for sexual satisfaction, for... Uh, <laughs> confidence in salesmanship and so on and uh, he, he said it's uh, very interesting that uh, he, uh, he, these are the records are sold on a money back basis and he says that uh, there is uh, regularly between 15 and 20 percent of people who write indignantly saying the records don't work at all and uh, he sends the money back at once uh, there are, on the other hand there are some uh, what over 20 percent who write enthusiastically, saying they're now much richer, their sexual life is much better, etc., etc. <laughs> and uh, these, of course, are, are the dream clients, and they buy more of these records. And then in between are those who complain they're not getting much results, and they have to be, have letters written to them saying, well, go persist, my dear, go on, and you'll get there, and they generally... <laughs> they generally do get results in the long run. Well, as I say, this... Uh, on the basis of this, I think we see quite clearly that uh, the uh, human populations can be categorized according to their suggestibility uh, fairly clearly. I, I suspect very strongly that this 20% is the same in all these, uh, these cases. And I suspect also that it would not be at all difficult uh, to recognize in very early childhood who were the, those who were extremely suggestible, who were those who were extremely unsuggestible, and who were those who uh, uh, occupied the intermediate space. Quite clearly, if everybody were extremely unsuggestible, um, organized society would be quite impossible. Uh, and if everybody were extremely uh, suggestible, then um, uh, dictatorship would be absolutely inevitable. I mean, it's very fortunate we have people who are moderately suggestible in the majority and who therefore preserve us from dictatorship but do permit uh, uh, organized society to, uh, to be formed. But uh, once given the fact that there are these 20% of highly suggestible people, it becomes quite clear that this is a matter of enormous political importance. Uh, for example, uh, any demagogue who is able to get hold of a, a large number of these 20% of suggestible people and to organize them is really in a position to overthrow any government in any country. And I mean, I, I think this, uh, uh, after all, we've had the most incredible uh, example in recent years of what can be done by efficient methods of, uh, of uh, suggestion and persuasion uh, in the form of Hitler. Uh, anybody who's uh, read, for example, Bullock's Life of uh, Hitler uh, comes forth from this with a, a sort of horrified admiration for this infernal genius who, who really understood human weaknesses, I think, almost better than anybody, and who uh, exploited them with all the resources then available. I mean, he knew everything. I mean, for example, he knew intuitively uh, this uh, Pavlovian truth that... Uh, uh, conditioning installed in a state of stress or fatigue uh, it goes much deeper than conditioning installed at other times. This was why all his big speeches were organized at night. He speaks of this quite frankly, of course, in Mein Kampf. He says this was done solely because people are tired at night and therefore are much less uh, capable of resisting persuasion than they would be during the day. 
And uh, we see in all his uh, techniques, he, he was using, uh, he, he had discovered intuitively and by uh, uh, trial and error, a great many of the, of the weaknesses which we now know about on a, in a sort of scientific way, I think much more clearly than he does, uh, than he did. Uh, but uh, the fact remains that uh, this differential suggestibility uh, this uh, susceptibility to uh, hypnosis, I do think, uh, has, is something which has to be considered very uh, carefully in relation to any uh, kind of thought about uh, uh, democratic uh, government. I mean, if there are 20% of the people who can really be suggested into believing almost anything, as evidently they can be, uh, then we have to take uh, extremely uh, careful steps to prevent the uh, rise of demagogues who will uh, drive them on into uh, extreme positions and then organize them into very, very dangerous uh, uh, armies, private armies, which may overthrow the, overthrow the government. Well, uh, this, as I say, is, is uh, 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 in this field of, of pure persuasion. I think we, uh, we do know much more than we did in the past, and obviously we now have uh, uh, mechanisms for multiplying the demagogue's voice and image uh, in a quite hallucinatory way. I mean, the television and the radio, uh, Hitler was making enormous use of the radio. He could speak to millions of people simultaneously. Uh, I mean, this, this alone, of course, is, uh, creates an enormous gulf between the modern and the ancient demagogue. And the ancient demagogue could only uh, appeal to as many people as his voice could reach by the yelling at, the, um, at his utmost, but uh, the modern demagogue can touch literally millions at a time. And, and of course, with his, the multiplication of his image, he can produce this kind of a hallucinatory effect which uh, uh, is of, of enormous uh, uh, hypnotic and uh, suggest, uh, suggestive importance. But then there are, there are various other methods which one can think of which uh, uh, have, thank heaven, as yet not been used but which obviously could be used. Uh, there is, for example, the uh, pharmacological method. This this was one of the things I, I talked about in, in Brave New World. I, I invented a hypothetical drug called Soma, which, of course, could not exist as it stood there because it was simultaneously a stimulant, a narcotic, and a hallucinogen, which seems unlikely in one substance. But the point is that in several, if you applied several different substances, you could get almost all these results even now uh, and the really interesting thing about the new chemical substances, the new mind-changing drugs, is this, that whereas, uh, if you look back into history, it's clear that man has always uh, had a, a hankering after mind-changing chemicals. He has always desired to take holidays from himself. Uh, but the, uh, and this is a, the most extraordinary fact of all, is that every naturally occurring stimulant, narcotic, sedative, or hallucinogen was discovered uh, in before the dawn of history. I don't think uh, there is one single one of these naturally occurring ones which um, modern science has discovered. Modern science, of course, has discovered better ways of extracting the active principles from these drugs and, of course, has discovered numerous uh, ways of synthesizing new substances of extreme power. But the, uh, the actual discovery of these naturally occurring things was made by primitive men, goodness knows how many centuries ago. Uh, there is, for example, in the, uh, underneath the uh, lake dwellings, uh, the early Neolithic lake dwellings which have been dug up in, the, uh, in Switzerland, where we find poppy heads which looks as though people were already using this most ancient and powerful and most dangerous of narcotics, uh, even in the days before the rise of agriculture, so that man was apparently a dope addict before he was a farmer. 
which is a, 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 a very, very curious comment on human nature. Uh, but um, the difference, as I say, between the ancient mind changers, the traditional mind changers, and these new substances is that they were extremely harmful, and the new ones are not. I mean, even the permissible mind changer, alcohol is not entirely harmless, as people may have noticed, uh, and uh, the, um, the other ones, the non-permissible ones, such as opium and cocaine, uh, opium and all its derivatives, are very harmful indeed. That they, they rapidly produce addiction, and uh, and in some cases um, lead at an extraordinary rate to uh, physical degeneration and death. Um, whereas these, these new substances, uh, this is really very extraordinary, the, that a number of these new mind-changing substances uh, can produce enormous revolutions within the mental side of our being and yet uh, do almost nothing to the physiological side. I mean, you can have a, an enormous um, revolution, for example, with um, LSD-25 or with uh, the newly synthesized drug uh, psilocybin, which is the active principle of the Mexican sacred mushroom. Uh, you can have this enormous uh, mental revolution with no more physiological revolution than you would get from drinking two cocktails. Uh, and, and this is a really a most extraordinary fact. And uh, uh, it is, of course, true that uh, pharmacologists are producing a great many wonder drugs which, uh, where the cure is almost worse than the disease. Uh, uh, every uh, new edition of medical textbooks contains a, a longer and longer chapter on what are called iatrogenic diseases, that is to say diseases caused by doctors. Uh, and, <laughs> Uh, the, uh, and this is quite true uh, that uh, many of the wonder drugs are uh, extremely dangerous. I mean, they, they can produce extraordinary effects, and in critical conditions, they should certainly be used, but they should be used with the utmost caution. But there, there is a, evidently a whole class of drugs affecting the uh, central nervous system which can produce enormous uh, changes in. Uh, in sedation, in euphoria, in uh, energizing the whole mental process uh, without uh, doing any perceptible harm to the body. And in this sense, uh, this represents, it seems to me, the most extraordinary revolution that it's it, uh, uh, in the hands of a, uh, of a dictator. Or, uh, these substances of one kind or another could be uh, used uh, in the most um, well with complete uh, first of all with, with complete harmlessness uh, and uh, the result would be that uh, um, I mean you can imagine a, a euphoric which would make people thoroughly happy even in the most abominable circumstances I mean the, these things are possible I mean this is the extraordinary thing I mean after all this has even been true with the uh, crude oil drugs. I mean, as a uh, houseman years ago remarked, uh, apropos of Milton's Paradise Lost, uh, he says, uh, and beer does more than Milton can to justify God's ways to men. Uh, and beer is, of course, an extremely crude drug uh, compared with these ones. And uh, you can certainly say that some of the psychic energizers and the new hallucinants can do incomparably more than Milton and all the theologians combined could possibly do to make uh, the terrifying mystery of our existence seem more tolerable than it does. Uh, so that here I think one has a, uh, an enormous uh, area in which the, uh, the ultimate revolution could function very well indeed. Uh, an area in which uh, a great deal of control could be used uh, by, not through terror, but through making life seem much more enjoyable than it normally does, uh, enjoyable to the point where, as I have said before, uh, human beings uh, come to love a state of things which by any reasonable and decent human standard they ought not to love. And this, I think, uh, is perfectly possible.
Well, then, uh, very briefly, let me speak about uh, one of the more recent uh, developments of, uh, uh, in the sphere of, uh, of neurology, the, uh, the implantation of uh, electrodes in the brain. Uh, this, of course, has been done on a large scale in, uh, in animals, and in, uh, in a few cases it's uh, been done in, hopeless, um, in cases of the hopelessly insane uh, and it is anybody who's uh, watched uh, the behavior of rats with uh, electrodes planted in different centers uh, must uh, come away from this experience with the most extraordinary doubts about what on earth is in store for us if uh, ever this uh, is got hold of by a dictator if uh, the uh, I saw not long ago some rats uh, in Magoon's laboratory at UCLA. Uh, there were two sets of them, one with electrodes planted in a pleasure center. And these rats were, the, the technique was that they had a bar which they pressed uh, and which um, turned on a very small current for a short space of time, which uh, we had a wire connected with their electrode and which... Um, uh, Stimulated this pleasure center, which was evidently absolutely ecstatic, was these rats were, were pressing the bar 18,000 times a day. <laughs> and, uh, apparently, if you kept them from pressing the bar for a day, they would press the bar 36,000 times on the following day and would fall till they fell down in complete exhaustion. <laughs> uh, and they would neither eat nor be interested in the, uh, the opposite sex and would just go on pressing this bar. Uh, then the most extraordinary rats were those where the electrode was planted halfway between a pleasure and a pain center, and where evidently the, the result was a kind of mixture of the most wonderful ecstasy in being on the rack at the same time. <laughs> and you, you would see the rats sort of looking at its bar and sort of saying, to be or not to be, that is the question. <laughs> and finally would approach and do it. And then it would... <laughs> Go back uh, with this awful, uh, I mean, the, uh, if one can humanize or anthropomorphize, I mean, he was feeling something terribly mixed. And he would wait for quite a long time before pressing the bar again, but he would always press it again. I mean, <laughs> this was the, the extraordinary thing. And the, in the, I notice in this um, most recent issue of the Scientific American, there's a very interesting article on electrodes in the brains of chickens. Uh, where the, the technique is, uh, is very ingenious. You, you sink into their brains a little um, socket with a, with a screw on it, and the electrode then can be screwed deeper and deeper into the brain stem, and you can test at any moment, according to the depth, of, uh, which goes in fractions of a millimeter, of what you're stimulating. And, and these creatures are not merely uh, stimulated by wire, they are fitted with a, a miniaturized radio receiver weighing less than an ounce, which is attached to them, so that they can be communicated with at a distance. I mean, they can run about in the barnyard, and you can press the button. And uh, the, this particular area of the brain to which the electrode has been screwed down to will be stimulated, and <coughs> you will get these uh, fantastic phenomena that a, uh, a sleepy chicken will suddenly get up and rush about, or... A, uh, an active chicken will suddenly sit down and go to sleep, or a hen will suddenly start sitting as though it were, uh, were hatching out an egg, uh, or a rooster will start fighting, or will suddenly go into a state of extreme depression. Uh, the, uh, the whole picture of the absolute control of the drives is, a, uh, is terrifying. And uh, in the cases, the few cases in which this has been done with very sick human beings, uh, the effects are evidently very remarkable, too. I was talking last summer to, uh, in England to Gray Walter, who is the um, most eminent exponent of the electroencephalogram techniques in England, and he was telling me that they, he's seen hopeless uh, inmates of asylums with these things in in their heads, and that uh, these people were suffering from the, uh, uncontrollable depression. And they were, they'd had a, uh, 
the electrodes inserted into something resembling evidently the pleasure center of the rat. Uh, anyhow, when they felt too bad, they just pressed a button in the battery in their pocket. And he said the result was fantastic. The mouth would go down would suddenly turn up and they would evidently feel, for, I don't know for how long at a time, very cheerful and happy. So that <clears throat> here again one sees uh, the most uh, uh, extraordinary uh, revolutionary techniques uh, which are now available uh, to us. Now, the, uh, I think... W what is obviously perfectly clear is that for the present these techniques are not being much used except in a purely experimental way but I think it is extraordinarily important for us to realize first of all to, to realize what is happening to make ourselves acquainted with what has already happened and then to use a certain amount of, of, of imagination to extrapolate into the future uh, the sort of things that might happen. I mean, what might happen if, uh, if these fantastically powerful techniques uh, were used by unscrupulous uh, people in authority? What on earth would, would happen? Well, what sort of society would we get? And... Uh, I think this is peculiarly important uh, because as one sees in looking back over history, we have allowed in the past all those advances in technology which have profoundly changed uh, a social and individual life, we've allowed them to take us by surprise. I mean, it seems to me that uh, during the late 18th century and early 19th century when the uh, new machines were making possible the factory system, it was not beyond the wit of man to see what, the, uh, to look at what was happening and to project into the future and maybe to forestall the um, really dreadful consequences which uh, plagued uh, England and most of Western Europe and most of this country uh, for about 50 or 60 years, the, uh, the horrible abuses of the factory system. I mean, if uh, a certain amount of forethought had been devoted to the problem at that time, if people had first of all found out what was happening and then used their imagination to see what might happen and then had gone on to work out means by which the worst uh, applications of the new techniques should not take place and then I think uh, Western humanity might have been spared about three generations of utter misery which was imposed upon the poor at that time and uh, similarly with the various uh, technological advances now. I mean, it's quite clear we have to start thinking very, very hard about the problems of automation. Uh, and again, I think we have to think still more profoundly about the problems which may arise in relation to these new techniques which may contribute uh, to the, this ultimate revolution. Our business is to, first of all, as, as I say, to to be aware of what is happening, then to use our imaginations to see what might happen, how this might be abused, and then, if possible, to see uh, that the enormous powers which we now possess, thanks to these um, uh, scientific and technological advances, uh, shall be used for the benefit of human beings and not for their ultimate degradation. Thank you. <coughs> <laughs> So I'm very sorry, I've talked much too long. It's quite all right. Mm. Just our brief discussion, and those of you who are interested in, in staying and listening, I'm, I'm sure that uh, it'll be well worthwhile. John, Mr. Post, would you like to have well, a question? I'm afraid my question shows a certain optimism which may not be justified. In a way, your quote from Hausmann that mm. malt does more than Milton can to justify God's ways to man. Uh, indicates that my remarks may show that I'm looking into the pewter pot to see the world as the world is not. Mm -hmm. At any rate, uh, I'm a bit worried about your 
picture or the picture you paint that the future may contain a number of monolithic scientific dictatorships and that there may be a groundswell in this, di in this direction, a groundswell uh, caused by the human tendency to seek pleasure where it can be found. But I'm struck by the fact that movements of that sort are always far more complex than any of our attempts at characterizing them. And I think that perhaps in this complexity is, lies a ray of hope that the future may not contain such monolithic scientific dictatorships and that the developments which we can expect in light of the various technological uh, achievements you mentioned may not lead in the direction of scientific dictatorships in the way you indicate. Now, this may depend to a great extent upon the nature or the characteristics of the nations in which these uh, results are first introduced. In other words, my question really is, when you project into the future and you say that the chances are very great of dictatorships of this kind occurring, could you qualify a bit more uh, what the chances are? Well, I, I, I say the, I don't think the chances are very great. I think they are there. And uh, I would think that one of the reasons why we may get more dictatorships than we like uh, lies uh, in a, quite a different field. I mean, with, the, uh, with large parts of the world increasing at 3% per annum in the population, uh, goodness knows what is going to happen. I mean, for example, uh, I was in India last uh, autumn, uh, and of course the, this is unutterably depressing, the in, enormous poverty, and the, the depression uh, grew a great deal uh, with the announcement just when we were there that the United Nations had co come to the conclusion that its earlier estimates of the uh, increase of the Indian population were very much too low. The estimates had been in the neighborhood of 1.7% per annum, which is about the same as the United States, which had to be corrected up to 2.2 or 2.3, which uh, is, I think doubles the population in about 32 years. And, of course, there are large parts of the world where the increase is uh, fully 3%, and in certain parts of the world even 4%. I mean, 3% doubles the population in 24 years, and 4%, I forget, in about 16, I think. Uh, but it seems to me that the, the danger in regard to dictatorship uh, arises with the, as the population presses more heavily upon resources and as the rising tide of expectation, which certainly exists in these underdeveloped countries, uh, is frustrated, as uh, undoubtedly it is going to be, because it's, uh, it is almost impossible to... Uh, make any development which shall catch up with much less go faster than the, than the population increase. Uh, so we may get a great deal of social unrest uh, and of course social unrest leads first to chaos and then to dictatorship. I mean I think that uh, the, the prospect of some kind of dictatorship either military or communistic I think in most cases more likely military uh, it seems to me very great within the next uh, 15 to 20 years. And whether some of these dictatorships may make use of these uh, modern methods remains to be seen. But I think that unhappily the, uh, the prospects for dictatorships in large areas of the world seem to me very great at the moment. I, I, I think that there is a considerable likelihood of this thing happening. Brilliant. The implication seems to be <clears throat> that um, we ought to be apprehensive that these techniques fall into the hands of dictatorships, demagogues, etc. But I could uh, easily envisage a situation where Western democracies could use these uh, methods, such as electrodes attached to the brain of, SAC Air Force, of the SAC in order to avoid accidental war. This could be uh, put in very moral terms. Mm. or that uh, you give soma to the discontented minority of the population who are suffering from uh, anomy, etc. Would you care to comment about the use of, demo uh, the use of these techniques by democracy, by democratic states? Well, you're a lot more pessimistic than I am. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, 
maybe your pessimism is justified. I, I don't. I mean, uh, this is the uh, the awful fact remains that when techniques have been discovered, sooner or later they tend to be applied, and uh, uh, in these uh, techniques, which uh, where the object of application uh, is the human being. You're obviously up against uh, the, the most uh, dangerous situation. And, and what will be the temptation uh, for those in power? I mean, after all, uh, we pray regularly not to be led into temptation, and this is a very profound and important prayer. I mean, uh, experience sadly shows that if we are tempted long enough and strongly enough, we almost invariably succumb, and that the, the whole... Uh, process of uh, setting up a decent society is essentially setting up a society in which temptations to abuse power and, uh, shall be reduced to a minimum. Uh, but uh, these uh, new techniques, I, I think, do uh, constitute a series of uh, very powerful uh, temptations uh, which to those in authority may be t finally turn out to be irresistible I hope not, but uh, I think what you say is, uh, uh, is something which we have to think about. I mean, that uh, this might uh, be uh, applied with justification, as you say, in the highest patriotic and moral terms, uh, even in uh, democratic societies. I trust not, but, uh, but one never knows, uh, particularly under conditions of extreme... Uh, military stress. It would appear, sir, that the type of dictatorship which you have outlined for us here today and uh, in more detail in the Brave New World uh, would uh, tend to be self-perpetuating unless there's a rise such a sharp social crisis as to disrupt the pattern of authority mm. and break the, the hold which is being passed on from one generation to mm. the other in these terms. Uh, but it would appear that the type of, of social crisis involved in large-scale warfare, whether it be nuclear warfare or otherwise, or the type of crisis involved in a widespread famine, etc., uh, would tend to disrupt this pattern of dictatorship. Mm -hmm. Therefore, would you say that it's necessary to have a high degree of social stability in terms of economic conditions, in terms of world peace, before a dictatorship of the sort you have described for us would be able to really imprint itself upon a population. This, I think, is very important. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's obvious that such a dictatorship, if it were going to survive, would have to guarantee the uh, adequate food supplies. I mean, uh, uh, I, I think, uh, and whether it could in fact do this uh, while the, the kind of, uh, of international tensions, whether, it could, whether we can expect a long-lasting dictatorship uh, within the context of nationalism, I don't know. I, I don't think so. I think we can expect di dictatorships to arise, but not long-lasting ones. I mean, I think that even the best organized dictatorship within the context of nationalism uh, is likely, as you say, to, to lead to, uh, to break itself down because one side of the paranoid uh, state of mind will lead it into conflict uh, uh, and um, w which will of course destroy it, uh, finally destroy it. I mean th this is a, is a very important point. And then of course another point which was made by Sir Charles Darwin in his book The Next Million Years which I think um, was one which uh, with, uh, in different terms I envisaged in Brave New World. I mean he, uh, he points out that uh, the human species is still a wild species. It has never been domesticated. I mean, a, a domesticated species is one which has been tamed by another species. Well, uh, until we get an invasion from Mars, we shall not be tamed by another species. All we can do is to try to tame ourselves, that an oligarchy tries to tame ourselves. But the oligarchy still remains wild. I mean, however much it succeeded in taming the, domesticating the rest of the race, it rem must remain wild. And this was the uh, part of the um, fable, the dramatic part of the fable of uh, Brave New World, is that the people in the upper hierarchy who were not uh, ruthlessly conditioned uh, could break down. And, uh, I mean, this, uh, uh, Charles Darwin insists that uh, because man is wild, he can never expect to, uh, to 
domesticate himself because the people on top will always be undomesticated and will sooner or later always run wild. Well, I, I think there's a good deal to be said for this, uh, uh, this point of view in, in, in regard to the permanence of any dictatorship. Yes, I have a question. Uh, I'm worried about a relationship that seems to exist between cost, consent, and control. Mm. If a government wants to control its people, of course, its job will be easier if they are more willing to consent, and the job will be correspondingly more costly if the corresponding consent isn't there. Uh, could you make a few remarks about the economic feasibility of introducing biological controls of the sort you talk about? I don't know. I mean, wouldn't it, uh, I would have thought in some ways it would be cheaper than maintaining very large uh, security forces and concentration camps and so on. Uh, that, uh, I mean, just as uh, in asylums, uh, chemical control is a great deal simpler and cheaper than physical control. I mean, the, the bad old days of straight jackets and uh, manacles and so on required quite a lot of, uh, of uh, of people to handle the insane, whereas uh, the tranquilizers uh, seem to require much, much fewer. I mean, that you can you can get uh, equal results uh, with uh, simpler and certainly pleasanter means. Uh, I have no idea about the uh, the actual cost situation, but I, I, it seems to me that it might actually be cheaper. I don't know. Well, I see that some of you are leaving for your four o'clock classes, and I will give you an opportunity to leave now. If uh, Mr. Huxley would be willing, we might be able to entertain some questions from the floor for a few mm. moments, would you, sir? Mm. Certainly, yes. Uh, uh, will those of you who are obliged to leave now, uh, please stand. I apologize, having gone on so long. Oh, no, that's mm. fine. I'm sure I much prefer to hear you discuss these questions, but I think we might be able to show up. Mm. I hope you're not finding it as uncomfortably warm in here. Well, it's getting a little warm, isn't it? There seems to be a completely windowless hall, isn't it? This part of the conditioning process, I'm sure. Oh. Is there any means of ventilation in this hall? I see one door there. But the next Tuesday at 2 Next Tuesday at I think there is some ventilation. The ventilation never seems to be able to meet the best. No, you have Well, the new drugs and uh, no, they were mainly discussing. Uh, I mean, there was a lot about uh, the, the problem of bringing technology to the underdeveloped countries. They had a lot of people from, from the United Nations there. A very able man uh, uh, who was a Vietnamese called uh, uh, Vu Van Thai. Uh, charming man. He was. Uh, spoke English with a strong French accent because he'd learned his economics in Paris. And uh, uh, he was very interesting. I mean, he said, I I'm speaking to you like a rat with electrodes in my brain because I speak from the inside. I'm not one of the experimenters on the outside. So, and he was, he was very interesting about it. I mean, about the, the, the difficulty that when you do introduce, say, one area of highly evolved technique into one of these backward countries, you create an enormous gap between the people who run this thing and profit by it and the mass of the population. Uh, I mean, a gap which is just as serious as the gap between the uh, have-not and underdeveloped nations as a whole and those who, uh, and the haves and the developed. And uh, he, his say, what he was saying was that you must have a an adaptation of technique which shall be suitable to these people and not try to bring in what you have already. But he says very little work has been done in this field. And there were a number of, I mean, there were several very able people. Richard Calder at the University of Edinburgh was there and, and uh, Arthur Goldschmidt, who is the director of the um, 
special services in the United Nations. And we had some extremely good uh, talks. Bring that up, Sean. Mm -hmm. But I have one question here, which is. Uh, Well, this is essentially the question which Mr. Huxley addressed himself to in his last statement, that how will control over the techniques been transmitted from one group to another? Apparently referring to how do the control of the techniques be uh, transmitted uh, from one elite, one generation of elite to, to another. Would you wish to comment further on this question? I know you could just speak to it just before. Um. Well, I don't think so. I mean, I, I do think there will clearly be a difficulty. I mean, there, there is always a difficulty in transferring power. I mean, well, after all, the, hence the uh, constitutions, uh, uh, written constitutions such as the United States, or a hereditary monarchy which, uh, in which uh, you got uh, uh, de facto power being de jure and the, the possibility of uh, passing power on without uh, much hitch from one generation to another, it may be that in a thoroughly well-controlled dictatorship, the problem of, of power at the top, the struggle for power, would not take place. But he, even there, I mean, simply because, again, because the, the oligarchy is itself not subjected to the extremes of conditioning, because it must retain a certain freedom in order to, uh, to be able to make uh, adequate decisions that, uh, that maybe the struggle for power would always remain a, a great problem, as it has been uh, throughout history, except where you have uh, had written constitutions or acceptable monarchies. Yes, yes sir. Uh, Dr. Huxley, did you adhere to the view or comment on the view that it's precisely the American society of Western democracy is uh, particularly susceptible this type of brave new world for the following reason, that uh, society is conditioned to adhere to a great uh, degree of social conformity. Mm. That in your period of stress, uh, this idea of conformity is further pushed, and uh, consequently it makes it much easier to develop these techniques. And that uh, it seems that politically, the extremities, uh, there is a growing feeling that we have to do away with the extremities, we have to keep on going the central path. Mm. And this would seem to me to make this much easier for a uh, type of dictatorship, as you said, to slowly, using the mass media that we're developing, mm. uh, mold the population, plus the factor that in some of the other uh, type societies, you have less inhibition about a brutal uh, struggle for power within the top hierarchy, whereas here there would be some type of a, uh, inhibition due to the so-called legal process that has developed, which would keep man from then violently attacking the leaders. Uh, well, the, the, <laughs> this business about uh, conformity, uh, I, I just don't know. It's, it seems extremely difficult, uh, certainly for me, to judge whether there is a, a higher degree of conformity uh, here and now than there has been in other places and in the past. Uh, I mean, I would have thought the, the tendency towards conformity was to some extent offset by the enormous uh, differentiation of function in uh, modern society. I mean that nothing could be less uh, homogeneous in function than a complex uh, modern society. I mean, people are doing extraordinarily different things and uh, although there may be a pressure to conformity uh, in, the, uh, in the suburbs, so to speak, or at home, there does seem a considerable pressure to non-conformity or to differentiation uh, in the uh, functional life of people. I mean, I have no idea to what extent one offsets the other and uh, whether the, uh, the conforming drive is uh, stronger than the the drive towards differentiation. I just don't, don't know what the answer to this. I mean, the, uh, I read about the uh, high degree of conformity, and of course one does see that uh, uh, certainly as compared with the 19th century, this society does seem to be more conformist. I mean, if one reads the history of the, of the utopian colonies which were set up during the 19th century, uh, 
this, this is really extravagant. I mean, that it's inconceivable to think of anything like the Oneida community or Brook Farm even uh, being set up today. I mean, that uh, this would be uh, so outrageous uh, that uh, uh, it would be impossible to imagine. And yet, in uh, these Victorian days, uh, there was this uh, freedom to... Uh, to make experiments, social experiments of the wildest character. Uh, again, exactly what this means and exactly uh, what the significance is for, for us and for the future, I don't, I don't really know. Uh, I mean, uh, I don't, just feel so incapable of really understanding the the uh, unutterably odd facts uh, of, of real life. I mean, I think one very often just has to accept them. There they are, and what really they mean, I don't know. Uh, I mean, perhaps this is one of the charms of history, that uh, one never really knows what it, uh, what it means. Yes, a gentleman, Matt. Well, this, uh, I mean, um, this is finally related to the whole mind-body problem. I mean, what uh, uh, we still don't know very much about uh, the relation of mind and body. I mean, I mean, we know clearly that they're related to one another very closely, but exactly how electrochemical events in the central nervous system uh, turn into the G minor quartet of uh, Mozart, we really haven't the faintest idea. I mean, I don't think we have any more idea than uh, Aquinas or Aristotle. I mean, all we can say is that it happens. Uh, and we do know a good deal more about the nature of the electrical and the chemical events. Uh, but uh, again, what the bridge is and uh, whether it's enough to say, uh, like the neutral monists, that... Uh, uh, the two aspects, the mental and the physical, are merely the same thing seen from different sides. Again, I don't know. I mean, even then, I mean, how can the same thing look so profoundly different? Uh, something I, I don't understand. And in relation to the, the mystical experience, I mean, clearly the, uh, this is correlated with uh, uh, electrochemical states within the uh, within the central nervous system, and uh, I would be all for studying these states. I mean, I think it's, it's exceedingly important that we should know uh, about it. I mean, I can imagine a whole branch of science which would be called uh, neurotheology or, or mycomysticism. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, this sounds funny, but nevertheless, it's, uh, we have to be able to speak in uh, the same kind of language about the two, uh, the two aspects of any of these experiences, the, uh, the, the neurological and the uh, subjective. And then we, uh, I suppose, on the philosophical level, we have to make the decision which uh, uh, Henry, uh, William James posed for us. I mean, he says perfectly obvious that, uh, that uh, mind uh, is a function of the nervous system, but is it a productive function or is it a transmissive function? I mean, it does, as Cabanis said at the beginning of the 19th century, um, does the brain secrete thought as the liver secretes bile? Or is it some kind of valve, as, uh, as James himself, I think, thought, and as certainly as Bergson thought, uh, through which a pre-existent uh, mental uh, element finds access into the human being. I mean, Bergson's view was that, of course, it was, it was a kind of reducing valve which uh, uh, permitted only those aspects of uh, universal consciousness which were useful to our survival as animals on the surface of the planet and as social creatures within a society. Uh, to come through. Well, I, I don't know. As James says, the, uh, the both points of view are quite difficult from a philosophical uh, 
point of view to uh, to justify, but the uh, the transmissive view is no more difficult than the productive view. And I, perhaps he's right. I think my own view is that on the whole, that he and Bergson were nearer the truth than the uh, Cabanis, but I don't know. This gentleman in the white shirt there. Dr. Huxley, would you care to comment on uh, Sir Julian Huxley's uh, views on artificial insemination donation? Well, I, I don't know that I know his views exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I just going to You care to clarify that mm. for us? Yeah. I, I think he favors along with a Dr. Herman Muller of uh, Indiana mm. University oh, yes. here in the United States. Mm. I think that uh, genetic, we can genetically improve uh, the human race by adopting amongst uh, the population uh, are, are the practice of artificial insemination using the uh, the sperm of, uh, of in intelligent individuals, and I don't know how he determines that these individuals are to be chosen, but I, I was just wondering if you were familiar with... Well, I mean, uh, the, uh, this is, of course, the whole problem of eugenics. I mean, if one knew how to apply eugenic principles, I think unquestionably one uh, could improve the the average quality of the human race. And I mean, there is some evidence, as Bert pointed out a long time ago, and as uh, Meadow has pointed out more recently, uh, that uh, there is a, some evidence that there is a slight decline of, uh, of average IQ. Uh, and that this certainly could be Remedied, but of course, as you say, the problem is to choose uh, who. I mean, one can, uh, I can perfectly imagine that if the Cold War goes on for a very long time, that side which first uh, uh, starts uh, artificial insemination for the production of people with greater talent in the physical sciences will win. Uh, and I read a paper the other day by, I forget who, a biologist at University of California at Santa Barbara, very, very, it was an amusing paper, but I mean it was, had quite interesting and serious aspects to it uh, on uh, sort of the hypothetical uh, Cold War uh, uh, action on the part of the dictatorial powers who were able to make use of eugenics in ways which would not, as this uh, author's name I cannot now remember, in ways uh, which were not um, necessarily very tyrannical, because of the, after all, the, the woman would be allowed to marry whomever she liked, but provided she had the children by selected uh, um, fathers outside the, the relationship. So that, I mean, there would be the, the actual personal relationships between husband and wife would not be modified seriously. But, I mean, this, as I say, was a was a fantasy, but it, again, it looked like a fantasy which uh, uh, could quite likely come true and uh, could, uh, as uh, the geneticists, I think, are all agreed, uh, could certainly lead to considerable results. Of course, on a, for eugenics to take place on any, uh, in a rapid way, you would have to be able to control the, uh, not merely the male genetic factors, but the female, which is, of course, much more difficult, but not impossible, I imagine. I have one written question here I'd like to read out to you, sir. Now, the population explosion is a grave danger to mankind, and yet the right to bear children is a right of free will. The only apparent way to stem this explosion is by some large-scale kind of conditioning or external coercion, yet this is also a grave danger. Is there any way out of this dilemma? <laughs> well, the way out of the dilemma surely has been pointed out in, in most countries of the, of the West where people voluntarily have uh, limited the size of their families. I mean, this has happened without any coercion unless you call the desire to uh, have a good economic life and to bring up your children well a coercion. But, I mean, this has in fact occurred. Uh, and, uh, I mean, in this country... Uh, after having 
reached a low during the Depression, the birth rate happens to have gone up. But, I mean, the point is that the, the control of the size of families is now completely voluntary here, I mean, or more or less completely voluntary, and which makes it profoundly different from the, uh, the people in the underdeveloped societies who are still going on producing ten children because the, the, the habit... Uh, persists that in order to for three children to survive you have to produce ten but now if you produce ten children seven survive because of elementary public health uh, uh, precautions which have been brought in uh, hence of course the uh, the enormous inc sudden increase the, the 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 death rate which used to be in the upper thirties as was the birth rate has now fallen in many of these countries to fifteen and 12 and even 10 so naturally there's an enormous increase uh, but uh, it's certainly going to take uh, some time to get people uh, to change their habits I mean uh, psychological inertia is, is much more powerful than physical inertia I mean, it's much easier to push a 10 ton truck than a human being Mr. Post has one further question uh, here. You've spoken of the ends to which drugs should not be devoted, uh, such as increasing conformity, mm. making men more content with what is actually an intolerable situation, securing the power of a small elite, and so on. Uh, to what ends do you think these drugs should be devoted, granted that we have them? Well, I mean, uh, I think the, in the therapeutically some of them are very valuable. I think already, for example, uh, some of the so-called psychic energizers have done a great deal in the mental field. I mean, they, I understand from Dr. Nathan Klein, for example, that uh, in very many cases you can use some of these psychic energizers instead of the electric, uh, electroshock therapy. Uh, and people say that electroshock therapy doesn't do any harm, but I cannot believe that partial electrocution is good for anybody. Uh, <laughs> And it seems to me a very good thing that if you, you can get people on a, a maintenance dose to, to get them out of these, uh, these awful catatonic and uh, depressed conditions, which you seem to be able to do. And uh, after all, there are many people, it seems to me, outside institutions who, who uh, have tendencies in the same direction, which uh, I think uh, a, a genuine psychic energizer might be... A, which could be used without harm to people would be of immense value. There was even, it was stated a, a few years ago, I remember, that the Russians had a five-year plan for increasing mental efficiency by a chemical means. I don't know whether this has gone on and what they've discovered, but it's, I would think it's probably on the cards that you could increase the span of attention, the, the amount of time you could... Uh, concentrate on things, the, uh, the power of observation and so on, by chemical as well as by educational means. I mean, I think that there are a, a number of probably quite good things you could, could do. And then, again, in the case of these very strange substances like psilocybin and lysergic acid, I think there's a great deal to be said for, for doing what uh, William James talked about, for getting people to realize that the, uh, their ordinary sort of common sense view of the world is not the only view, that uh, the universe they inhabit is not the only possible universe, and that there are other very strange universes which some people spontaneously inhabit. I mean, a man like William Blake obviously inhabits an extremely different universe from uh, that which most people inhabit. And I, I think it's probably very uh, wholesome for people to... Uh, to be permitted to realize this fact, to perceive that the, uh, the world of the mind is immensely large and that there are these very strange and extraordinary areas in them. And, uh, and there are plenty of cases in the literature where the, uh, these kind of experiences have produced a kind of conversion. Uh, you know, the work which is being done at Harvard now by Leary in the prison, uh, in the local prisons in Boston, uh, very interesting, a sort of a series of, of extraordinary conversion experiences among hardened criminals have, have emerged from this. And, uh, 
here again. There may be, I mean, we don't know enough about the subject yet, but uh, there may be um, possibilities of very great importance here of, of sort of removing obstacles. I mean, the, the justification of this uh, was stated by Bergson years ago when he was defending William James against uh, his use of nitrous oxide. Uh, a number of fellow philosophers thought this was infradig that an eminent philosopher should resort to these chemical means, uh, which enabled, I mean, James remarked that uh, only under nitrous oxide could he understand what Hegel meant. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bergson said that uh, it must be realized that uh, the experiences which uh, Mr. James uh, describes uh, are not caused by the gas. The gas is merely the occasion. The, the gas is removes certain obstacles, which might have been removed equally well by psychological or psychophysical means, the so-called spiritual exercises of the various religions, uh, but uh, can also be removed by these chemical means. And that, if you can do so without doing harm to yourself, so much the better. And incidentally, it's one of the great uh, uh, tragedies, I think, in, in psychological research that uh, the James, I think in about 1905, uh, uh, made an experiment with peyote. Uh, and as he had a rather weak stomach, all that he got was this violent vomiting. He says, I'm afraid I must take the visions for granted. I got only the nausea. And it's, a, it's an awful pity if he'd had a stronger stomach, we should have had this research beginning 50 years ago. But uh, his weak stomach prevented this, and we've had to wait till much later to get this thing really going. Well, before we close the program, uh, Mr. Delaney, Graduate Student Association, asked me to announce that there will be a meeting of the Graduate Student Association next Tuesday at noon. Now, I want to express our appreciation to Mr. Huxley on behalf of all of those who are uh, here for lest our augmented knowledge restrict our understanding. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.